Yeah. And I think one thing I've seen some brands struggle with who've tried to expand from overseas to the US is they treat their brand exactly the same as you know how it should be in their country. And it's this difference. Um, the brand feel, the content, the description, um, the focus of how you dial into your consumer is completely different. Um, in Europe, they might want more, more information. In the US, they might want less information. I think if you're really looking to try and take a product from overseas and bring it over here, I think really understanding the consumer base here is really important. Adam, uh, thanks for coming on today, man. Uh, against all odds with the calendar gods, we made this thing happen. Yeah, that's that's for sure. Uh, it's good to meet you again, Brian. Really appreciate you having me on the, the podcast, video cast, whatever they call it these days. But uh, I'm here. And I'm really excited to get into it today. So I really appreciate you having me on. Cool, man. Cool. Uh, so, uh, you know, a few things, a few things we talked about covering today, but just to start, so you're the, the CEO of Noticed. You guys are at Shopify e-commerce agency. Uh, I saw you guys did liquid death as one of your clients. I have my, uh, my liquid death can here that I'm drinking for uh, hydration during this podcast episode. So, uh, you know, I guess just, let's, let's just kind of start with you giving me the rundown on like, you know, first of all, why you chose Shopify as a niche, as an agency, uh, what drove you into that specific tech, uh, you know, choice and then e-commerce in general. And I'd love to just kind of hear from you uh, what you guys do, where the market, where you see the market going and just anything tangential to that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I think if we just start off, I think it's really all starting where it all started. I kind of keep it top level, but um, I started freelancing back in, in 2012, you know, doing that gig, you know, it's kind of where it all started for me. And was doing like WordPress, Drupal developments, you know, informational sites at the time. And, Right around 2013, I started to get more in Magento and Econ and was just doing odd small Econ stores here and there. And uh, I got a brand that contacted me from Blanco, Texas. It was an old country woman that lived in a ranch, like a massive ranch. She was in the 50s and she sold high-end Western women's wear. So like ponchos, cowgirl boots, you know, um, cowgirl hats, etc. It was expensive stuff. It was like Average order value was like four or five hundred dollars. You know, it was pretty expensive. Wow. And um, anyway, she came to me. She said my store's broke, and I was like, you know, I'll try and see if I can help. <laughs> she was on CS Card at the time, and it was like a, a, a platform that was from Europe. So I ended up fixing it, and you know, I ended up doing some Google keyword research on her business, and just basically uncovered that she was in a, a massive market, untapped opportunity. It was a lot of old school players in it, really mostly retail, you know, women that were in that Midwest area. And there was about a 50 to $60 million market cap based on, you know, the search volume I was looking at. And I said to her, listen, you've got- The whole industry was 50 to 60 million or her company was? The whole industry. Yeah. Okay. It was very niche. It was super, super niche because she was selling high ticket items. Like, you know, the items were pretty expensive. Like for a pair of boots, it was five, six hundred bucks um, minimum. And, you know, it was it was one of those items where you're not going to come across that type of consumer that regularly. And, you know, just because it was the type of industry it was in, you know, it's not a big market. And, you know, I ended up approaching and I said, listen, you know, you've got a big opportunity here. I think you should rebrand, replatform, and, you know, basically relaunch your whole marketing strategy. And it was only about 45 grand investment at the time. You know, for me, it was a lot of money. For her, it was a lot of money. She was only doing about half a million in business. And she was like, no, I can't do it. I was like, if you don't do this, I will start your business tomorrow because like that's how much of an opportunity it was. And I think that kind of really made her understand like, okay, I'm, I'm being serious. And she ended up jumping on it and we ended up replatforming to Magento in September of 2013. And in 12 months, took her from 450,000 in revenue to 1.8 million. And basically that was kind of like the aha moment. I was like, you know what? In four months, moment. you said you did that? 12. 12 months. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So that was like a ha-ha moment. I was like, you know what? This is this is cool. I like the gratification of like converting a customer taken for the buying journey and doing everything from soup to nuts. And that's kind of really where it started for me, Brian. And I just started doing more Magento from that point on. Um, I'm going to miss one highlight here. You're probably going to laugh at this. One of her customers 
I can't remember their name. I'm trying to remember their name. But they were in LA, but they used to spend $40,000 a year on his store, just on clothes. Wow. 40 grand. So that was one thing I do remember about them. They had a pretty loyal customer base, to say the least. So, yeah. <laughs> and this, um, uh, this, this niche, like, it... it you, you probably know the stat better than me, but I, I think I've heard like, uh, you know, when, when it comes to e-commerce consumer spending, it's largely females or largely women uh, yeah. that are doing the spending. Is that, is that an accurate stat? Yeah, it's, it's about 60% of it. Yeah. It's, it's mostly female. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And I think it's, it's interesting because where we are as a business today, it's probably similar. I would say I've never, I haven't done the numbers, but I would say it's probably pretty close. Um. Yeah, it's 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 definitely close to that. So it's um yeah, I think from there it was like for me, going from that point, that was kind of where it really clicked for me. And I ended up doing more e-com from that point, small magento. And then toward the end of 2015, I was really starting to see the, you know, really understand the issues with Magento. You had to have, you know, a, a cloud proxy system, you have to manage the host and you have to upgrade the host. And if you know the you know the 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 amount of traffic was affecting you know the bandwidth of the server. And then you had meetings of the software and you had to keep up with you know all of the constant iteration of improving the site. And I just realized that there's there's just really got to be a better solution out there. So I went on to my own you know curious little road trip and just started looking at different platforms. I came across Shopify around about 2014. I'd heard about it but it was mainly known as like an SMB platform and I was moving a bit up at that point. You know I was charging like a thousand dollars, five thousand dollars a website when I was freelancing when I first started out and kind of started leveling up at that point, you know, in 2014, 15. And basically, you know, just built a Shopify store. That was kind of the first start. And it was like, okay, this was really easy to build on. It makes complete sense. But you know, a lot of our customers who are much bigger were not going to be able to use it. And in 2016, got a newsletter from Shopify Plus, uh, sorry, Shopify. And they announced Shopify Plus at the time. And I was like, okay, checked it out, looked at the specs, looked at the new tech that they've built. And I was really, just really knew in myself that this was going to be the next big thing. And jumped on it, basically decided to completely transition all of my customers from Magento to Plus, explained to them the reasons why, and they all got it, most of them at least. And, you know, literally that was kind of where it really started. And we became one of the first. 10 plus partners in the world so we were very early and that's something that we've been really good at brian like we've been very good to catch on to the tech really early because i'm always you know trying to stay ahead of the curve and keep up with everything but that's kind of where it all started yeah so that's where notice got launched you know in 2015 and you know we ended up becoming a fully focused e-commerce agency and going from there and today we're a 45 plus agency full-time you know full-time employees all across the us canada uk and we basically do everything from site redesign, three platforms, CRO, and retention marketing, email SMS. So yeah, that's kind of us in a nutshell. Oh, that's awesome. So uh, it, you know, Shopify is definitely interesting. It's gotten really interesting in the last you know five or six years. Uh, what uh, I mean, the the ecosystem is like so crowded now. There's you know, I think there's like a thousand partners or something crazy. Uh, so you are yeah. one of the first ten. Uh, do they still, uh, is there like, is there value, I, I guess, being like in that first 10 still to this day, or do, do you feel like that crowded ecosystem kind of nullifies that value anymore these days? Uh, I'll, I'll be careful with words. That's the best way to put it. <laughs> I would say it's, um, it used to be really, I would say when you became a plus partner earlier on, like it's like any platform, like they need you at that point. And as they get bigger and, you know, they start to really build their partner ecosystem, they can't really commit to like everyone, right? There's so many of them. Um, everyone's bringing different value, focusing on different industries, different models. So we still do get a lot of value from partnership. Like we get a lead from them. We really get involved in co-marketing. But the market has become commoditized. Like it, it is becoming commoditized. For me, the big problem, like really the opportunity I've been to be really explaining to the team is... I think the issue right now with a lot of brands that we're seeing, the enterprise brands we work with, is they're basically segmenting all of their different services to different agencies. And that ends up becoming like an operational nightmare for them. It also becomes a liability because they've got silos. So you've got multiple points of contact. You know, the manager may be a, 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 a site agency who's managing their site CRO. Maybe they do one of the service for them. 
and you've got another agency doing influencer, another agency doing maybe content or branding. So there are all these different agencies involved in the process. And the issue is, is really there's a complete silo between all of them. The data's all over the place. There's no attribution layer. There's no tracking of how well a business is doing in different parts of the business. And I think that's a real big problem. And I haven't really seen anybody really solve that problem of becoming like a full omni-channel agency delivering proper value. That's really the challenge right now. I think really for, for the market where it is, there definitely needs to be a change in the agency model because I think there is, you know, a problem with it. And, you know, I think the only way you can really differentiate your value today is if you're really vertically specialized and you do that thing really, really well. But then you've got to really have complementary agency partners to support with the other channels. Um, or two, you're ultimately providing more of an agnostic model where you've got a pricing, I would say, advantage, whether it's onshore and an offshore model. I think that's just the way the market's becoming now. And as you know, with AI and everything, like everyone's talking about this AI taking over the world. I've got, um, I've got my own opinion on it. I think it is going to destruct industries, including ours. Uh, I think it's probably about two, three years away before the platforms catch up. But that's like another whole you know, spanning in the works where we're getting ready for of really preparing ourselves of what's our business going to look like in the next five or 10 years and how are we going to adapt to those changes? Because it's it's pretty crazy out there at the moment. As you know, it's, 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 it's a bit different, right? I want to take a quick break from the episode and say, if you're enjoying this content, the best way you can say thank you is to subscribe. So if you're on YouTube, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. And if you're on one of the podcast platforms, hit the subscribe button there as well. And also share it out to your friends and colleagues. If you find this content useful and you think other people will enjoy it as well, please send it out. And back to the episode. This concept of, uh, you know, kind of like, so you, so you, you guys are uh, vertically specialized in, in Shopify as a technology, but then... Uh, so that might be more of a horizontal capability, but then uh, are you vertically specialized? I see pretty much everything listed on your website is consumer brands. Are you really specialized in like the B2C or D2C, as they say, direct to consumer e-commerce? Or do you guys also get into like B2B or any other kind of uh, e-commerce? Yeah, so we've been primarily focused on D2C, you know, just with the evolution of D2C the last, you know, decade that kind of started. We've been kind of really focused on, on that area, really I would say it's primarily been focused on taking new emerging brands who are really destructing legacy retail brands, uh, you know, that are focused offline and really, really scaling them. Like that's what we've been really focusing on is, is those new birth, new birth breeders, I call them. And, you know, it's for us, it's, it's definitely getting to a point now where the online market, I wouldn't say it's been totally consolidated in, with these different brands, but there's still opportunities there. Like there's always going to be opportunity, but I definitely think it's become more difficult for brands to come in and really compete with some of these brands that have established themselves online. So we really come in and we really try and focus on really making sure that they're building truly one-to-one -one brand experiences. And that's something that traditional B2B brands struggle with. A lot of B2B brands, they they have that mindset that they want to be in as many stores as they sorry, they want to sell as many products as they can, to as many stores as they can, to as many customers as they can. They've got a very wide focus, whereas D2C brands, it's a very narrow focus. They want to sell complementary products that are interrelated to each other. And they only want to sell to a segmented retail strategy, meaning that they only sell to retailers that are complementing their brand, that are their target audience. And then the same thing is also with their customers online. They're going after their customers that actually want this product, need this product, understand the benefits of the product, that's what they get that a lot of these you know, other brands don't understand. And it's, we still get those legacy retail brands come to us and we sit in a room, Brian, and we're like trying to explain to them, like, this is the challenge you've got and you, know, you need to consolidate. And the conversations that I have time and time again is we can't do that because you know, we've got all of these different retailers to support, et cetera. But the reality is, is they're losing incremental market share they're diluting market share long term and they don't get it. Um, you know, it's it's I think the example I would use is Tesla. You know, Tesla disrupted the automobile market in 10 years because they focused on a very focused product, a very focused customer. And you know, they just basically did everything that the automobile legacy automobile company didn't do. And the retailers, 
you know, with today, the brands of today are doing this exact same thing. They're just really not getting that the consumer's online. And to get that consumer online, you've got to get them focused on this screen. And if you can get them focused on the screen, you've more than likely got a chance of getting them to purchase here than in a fridge or shelf space if they've never heard of your brand before. And most of our brands, they're objective. Just, uh, for, the, for the listeners, you're holding up your phone. So you're, you're saying specifically uh, the screen to focus on is the mobile screen. That's where a lot of these conversions are happening more so than, than you know, web browsers. Yeah, this is, this is all where it's happening. Like the, the way these emerging brands look at, at digital is they look at this as their primary channel and their objective is simple. And, um, you know, if they're a food and beverage or health and wellness, which is what we primarily focus in, their goal is that they can get a really, really good brand that's very compelling, super concise, very focused in on what who they are and what they are and who they serve. What their objective is is simple. If they can get you to click an ad on Instagram or TikTok or go to an influence that you follow and they're promoting that product, they can get you from that touch point to their site and your site is really, really immersive and not really cluttered with stuff and confusing. And they can get you to click that first touch to conversion in less than three clicks. They've already achieved that objective. It's the same with Liquid Death. Like I think uh, Mike, when he launched, um, they did a hundred grand trial run within the first month. Just the first month they launched the hundred grand all online. And their objective was simple. Get them to try the product. If they try the product, what is the chance they're going to buy this in retail again? It's highly more likely they're going to buy it because they tried it, they liked it. Now you've got actually validation when you go to a Target or Walmart. That if I so see that, that, that's a good example. I want to jump in here, like with death, because uh, I think commoditization and e-commerce has all consolidated into Amazon. Like you talked about consolidation earlier, like Amazon has like completely owned the commoditized e-commerce market. And the only moat that I see, like I, I'm really curious in your opinion, the only moat that I see is brand at this point. And Liquid Death's a great example because their product is literally water. Like there's nothing special about it. I can get water from my tap, from, you know, from my sink. Like there's there's water everywhere. Like the <laughs> the the moat for Liquid Death is their branding, their Instagram content, like, you know, kind of like the uh, the type of person that like drinks Liquid Death or wants to be seen drinking Liquid Death is, you know, it's kind of like almost like a fashion statement in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's like to me the the only remaining frontier in e-commerce especially D2C is like is like brand moat or some sort of like a high end uh you know uh angle but what 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 are your thoughts on that like is there any commoditized categories that D2Cs can still win at or is Amazon just like annihilated at all Well the one thing I want to say is people just one thing I was going to call out was people think that like like with death some people have heard it's like is it a gimmick um, I actually thought the same thing when I was like trying it. I was like, you know, what is this? But then I actually understood how genius the idea is. Um, basically, they're taking the Monster Energy drink and the Red Bull drink user away from that drink. It's basically canned soda water with flavor, but it's healthy. And really all they're trying to do is get that, that truck driver, that construction worker, that person who's on the go all the time but doesn't drink healthy they maybe pick up the wrong drink, like a monster or whatever it is, and they're just replacing that with a can of soda water because they want that taste of soda, which is the can itself. But they started with water. So I'm drinking the original one right now. This is yeah, literally they... water. It's just literally plain water. Like there's not, there's no flavoring. There's no like carbonation. There's no, like it's just straight water. That's it. Straight water. Yeah. But th that's, that's the genius behind it. It's, it's total genius. Um. But yeah, that's that's kind of who they're going after. And they, you know, Liquid Death and brands like them, the way, where Amazon comes into it is Amazon is used as a vehicle for them and other brands really to get to the customer quicker. You know, when it comes to ship, everyone knows, like, especially in food and bev, like if you've just acquired a new customer that's never tried your product before, you know, the chance of them canceling is very high because of, you know, obviously with the economy right now and all these different things, but it's also the cancellation rate is, is there. It's a thing. So their objectives, if they can use Amazon to win with their strategy, which is to scale their brand and drive more shelf space, then they're going to use that as an advantage. Maybe they're losing some margin there, but ultimately they're winning when it comes to speed. And that's the only way I can see brands kind of, really controlling their, their equity of their brand online 
and not getting diluted into this, you know, huge mix of other beverage brands. But they're really just using Amazon as 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 a shipping vehicle. So that's really where I see it getting used. Um, I think any brand that goes directly through Amazon and is trying to build a brand on Amazon, you're just ultimately going to get lost in you know a massive, you know, a, I would say Amazon of products. There, if you really want to build a brand, you've got to really build it B to C first, and that's the only way you're going to be able to have you know that type of leverage when you go to retail because the what we see regularly, Brian, is that when you when when these when the Magic Spoon would be a good example, um, you know they built a healthy cereal brand. It's like forty dollars for four packs. It's expensive, but it's a healthy cereal. They built their business in to eight figures in twelve months, and um, like scaled it. And online, they went over sixty million in three years, all online. And when they basically took that business from idea to launch to scale all online no retail the retail buyers ended up coming after them and well that's what a lot of these dtc brands are using it they're using dtc when they come up with this idea as a way to reverse engineer how b2b works and b2b the way it used to work was i would have to go and sell my product to a merchandise buyer and convince them that this product was better than the next other person but then the issue was is i would be on their terms and those terms would not be that great now it's like, okay, we can build our own brand online. We can you know, do a POC and actually prove that this product is needed, there is a market for it, and that we're actually going to do it on our terms. And that's what happened with Magic Spoon. Like Target came to them and we're like, we want exclusivity to your product. If you go to Target now, it is on the main aisles in Target. And it's because they ultimately built their own brand and they negotiated their own terms. And I think that's the advantage of building B2C. Um, but Amazon's just always going to be a part of that strategy because you know you're, you're ultimately going to want to get that product in hand as quickly as possible. So it's it's the way it is. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Do you do you uh, have you ever built uh, something like you mentioned? Kind of wanting to do that that women's uh, uh, cowgirl or what would you call it? Uh, like a uh, country wear. It was women's country. Wear, country yeah. Wear, yeah. Yeah. So the the women's country wear. Uh, is that it's like something like that? Have you ever done something where you you built your own brand, or is it typically uh, the agency model? It's it's been the agency model, but I actually come from a business background, so I could say I was technically doing it with my dad. So my dad used to own a motorcycle protection wear brand, and uh, we used to sell like full one piece wear suits, gloves, hats. It was his own brand that he made, and um, it actually became. Pretty decent size in the UK. He started it in '97, and seeing him go through like the whole evolution of his his business, um, you know, he used to get all of his products manufactured overseas. And uh, I was only young when he started it, but really, I got my my business one on one lesson from him. He used to take me to all the trade shows, and we used to go and market the product at those trade shows. So we have trade shows such as like um, we used to, we did um, Daytona. We used to go to Daytona do like a whole outdoor um, tent, like a professional tent and really market our product there. And, uh, you know, I started in that business when I was about 10. I was away from the weekends for him. He used to pay me the least, make me work the hardest. And really for me, what I got to learn with, you know, basically with it, with the B2C, you would call it, is my dad used to take me to Ireland. We used to go on a ship from Liverpool to Ireland, originally from Liverpool. And we used to have like a massive car full of all of the samples. And he would take me to all these different retailers in Ireland or basically motorbike retailers. And he would go door to door and basically try to convince him on the products that he had and like why they were better. And I would be like the person like just watching him, listening to him. And I would be passing the samples. So I was kind of like his, his water boy, you want to call it, but I was listening at the same time. Dude, that is invaluable, man. That like that upbringing, like that, like seeing your dad just out there hustling and selling, and at a young age, uh, that is like formative experience that uh, I'm sure has paved the way for for your entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneurial journey. Yeah, he, he was a tough dad, but he, he definitely he definitely has taught me a lot, and he took me on so many of those. Like I went countless ones, so I got to see. B2B sales. So that's kind of where it all kind of tied in for D2C for me and it all makes sense. Um, but yeah, I got, got the whole exposure and one um, one claim to fame about five years ago, my sister was texting me 
and she said, hey, go on YouTube and type in Hotline Bling. I don't know if you know Drake, right? So yeah. I was like, what? And I didn't even listen to Drake, to be honest with you. And I went on YouTube, typed in Hotline Bling, and I remembered every single skew of my dad's. My dad named each skew after a famous song. My dad was part of an Eagles tribute brand, so Eagles, the, the country band. So he named each skew after one of the products, and um, so after one of the songs, sorry. And um, basically, I went on there, looked at the video. It was Drake with my dad's jacket on. It, it was called Double Dealer, the song from one of the Eagles. And literally, I was watching Drake wear one of my ja- dad's jackets. I used to pick this jacket up, stock it every day, sell it at the trade shows. Um, and you could pull any skew up with me, and I would still remember the name of it. And that was kind of like a, a really good moment for my dad. Like, he was really proud of it, just to kind of see that his product had at least made to the top, if you want to call it, right? <laughs> That's pretty cool, man. Yeah. Uh, so we talked a lot about, like, building new brands. You talked about Magic Spoon. I've, I've used their product. I've, you know, eaten their cereal before. It's pretty good. It's like protein cereal. Uh the uh, liquid death, you know, I, I'm obviously, you know, I've got my liquid death can here. So I'm a, I'm a consumer there. So these are like, you know, brands that were created. Uh, what are your thoughts on? So I was in Europe uh, recently and I found this like really good water brand. It's uh, it's got like such good mouthfeel. It's really basic, uh, meaning like acidity level is super basic. So like it almost tastes like it has like some salt and minerals and maybe like some baking soda or something like it has like that really basic like flavor to it. Yeah. And it's got like these really fine bubbles that almost has like a champagne mouthfeel. So when you're drinking it, it's got like really fine, like champagne mouthfeel bubbles mixed with like that, like basic aftertaste, excellent water. I loved it. And uh, you can't get it in the US only you, you can on Amazon, but it's like $15 a bottle. So you order like 10 bottles and you're spending like over $100 on Amazon yeah, to get it here. Easily. Uh, what are your thoughts on rather than like creating a new brand from scratch, uh, you know, like just importing a brand that's already big in a certain market elsewhere and then creating in that brands uh, in, in the United States. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a good call. I'm curious to taste the bacon soda, soda side to see what that tastes like, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, next time you're in the city, man, I got, I, you know, I bought the $15 bottles on Amazon. So I got some here if you want to try it. <laughs> yeah, let me know. Um, so it's, it's, it's definitely interesting because for me, being from the UK, anytime I go over there, I see products I'm like this would really do well in the US. And you know, I think there is definitely a lot of products over there that would probably do well. I think that the key thing is, is when it comes to what I've seen with brands trying to expand from Europe or, you know, Epic over to North America, is it's just really understanding the consumer here. Because for me, the consumer base and their likings, their buying trends are very different than, you know, any other country. It's just the way it is. And I think one thing I've seen some brands struggle with who've tried to expand from overseas to the U.S. is, they treat their brand exactly the same as, you know, how it should be in their country. And it's just different. Um, The brand feel, the content, the description, and the focus of how you dial into your consumer is completely different. Um, In Europe, they might want more more information. In the US, they might want less information. I think if you're really looking to try and take a product from overseas and bring it over here, I think – really understanding the consumer base here is really important. Like that's, that's big, the biggest thing. Um, my dad used to say, go, go and travel and just learn about people because that's the best way you're going to understand a consumer is understand, you know, their culture, understand what they value, understand how they buy. He said, that's the, one of the best ways you're going to get to understand them. And I think for me, that's just something that a lot of companies don't really think of. Um, so for me, I think it's definitely a lot of opportunity. I think there's a lot of, how would you validate that though? Would you just like run like run Facebook ads and see? Like I, I thought like this water that I'm talking about, uh, I thought like literally just running ads with the water bottle, like in a really, you know, like uh, exotic setting, just like the water bottle poured into a glass and then the slogan could just be like water with a champagne mouthfeel. Yeah. Or something like that. <laughs> like I, I, I feel like that would sell, man. If you can get it to the consumer for like, four dollars a bottle or five dollars a bottle i think that would be you know it's like a quarter it's like a third the price of what it is if you try to get it on amazon now but it's still like a really high-end price point i can see it selling sell man 
Yeah. I can I see mean, it. I, it's just a hunch. Like I don't have any data to back it up, but how, how would you back that up? Like if, if you were like going to build that business or like if a client came to you and said, Hey, I want to like take this brand and expand it into the U S market. Yeah. How would you, uh, how would you do that? Uh, I think the, the first step what I would be looking to do is really making sure that I was speaking to the right agencies, trying to ensure that I can understand what agencies get my business. Um, like what, what, what if, what if, what if, um, what if like you were tasked with it? Like forget agencies, like it's your job. Like, you know, th- let's say this brand came to you and said, Hey, Adam, I want to expand to the U S uh, like what's the game plan. So the first thing I would really focus on would be really understanding like what my customer acquisition strategy would be. So, you know, Google ads is really going to be as a part of your funnel, but it's not going to be where it's going to be starting out for most of your brands. I think with, with mo- if it's a food and bed product, for example, like the way you're going to really get traction is if you've got a good product and you really believe in it, you've got a good brand, the easiest way to really validate a proof of concept in a new market is Facebook, Insta, TikTok ads. But if you really want to validate its scale, I think the quickest way to do it is really developing viral content. If you can develop viral content around other influencers and you can get influencers on your belt, that's the quickest way you're going to know your selfie rate. If you've got a selfie rate goal of X and you want to prove that there's an actual validated market in the US, your goal is to try and sell through and have specific metrics that justify and prove that there is a market there. Because you could, let's just say I get a, a decent sized influencer who's got a relevant audience to my business and I think that my product would sell well. For me, going to them and maybe getting a, a short-term partnership might be paid. I would rather go and pay that influencer to get answers around my product to say, okay, if I can sell through this line, let's just say it's two containers and making this completely up, then ultimately I know I've got something here. And if I know that my repeat purchase rate is matching what my Europe, European repurchase rate is, if the numbers are close, then I know that there's something that is cyclical here that it can really pivot over to this other new market and work well, but I wouldn't jump full fit, like full into it because ultimately it's always going to be different. I, I don't think really... they even nailed D2C though in Europe because I've looked at their website. Uh, Cause I've been like scratching my head on this thinking like, man, is this not, like, do I want to reach out to the manufacturer and like try to do a deal here? But uh, you know, they, they seem to be like through restaurant sales primarily. Uh, they they seem like very niche. Got it. So they're mainly B two B kind of. Yeah, D two C is probably not in their minds. I think their website. Yeah, I looked at their website. It doesn't look like their D two C first product. It looks like their website was an afterthought. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like I, for me, those type of businesses that are kind of not really proven whether they're good. You know that they're good probably in retail because it's probably getting bought regularly there. But when it comes to online in a different country those are a bit more different for me those are ones that you want to prove out and the really product is amazing though like the product is actually really good and uh yeah if I you mean, like I, it, that's saying something right so <laughs> what's that if you like it that, that's already validation right there right yeah yeah i'm yeah. curious like how uh like how how much are these things product driven versus just the brand was created in the right way? Like, you know, if the right influencer goes and, you know, uses it, uh, especially if it's, you know, if, if the right influencer like has the right messaging around it and, you know, puts it out to the right audience, you know, how much of it is actually like product quality versus just that, that, you know, kind of marketing distribution channel? Yeah, it's a really good question. Because I think the question mark comes is like with liquid death, we could be asking the same question, right? Because is the is the product unique? It is. It tastes. The branding's good. unique and the can the design is unique, unique. Yeah. but the, there's like nothing special about the water. Like it literally, I could just, I could, I have like a Berkey filter in my house yeah. that like you know uh, purifies the water. I could take liquid death, put it in a glass, and then Berkey water and put it in a glass. The Berkey water came out of my sink, you know, Philadelphia tap water, and I could do a blind tasting. I wouldn't know the difference. But you're still going to buy it though, right? Yeah, I still buy it because the can's <laughs> cool. It's got like a skull on it. You know, it's like murdering my thirst. So, uh, yeah. you know, that's uh, that that's why I, uh, I I buy it. But uh, yeah, they've got the hook now. So that's the thing is, is once the branding and the marketing hit you, now it's like you're there. They've just got to keep you there. 
Um, yeah, it's it, it's 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 a really I would say it's a it's tough because you would think that the norm would be you create a really good product. It's amazing whether it's you know a tasting product or non tasting product, and that you know it would just sell. And I think the problem is now is we're coming across a lot of these different brands that are creating unique products in a different way. They might not taste the best or they might taste okay, but I actually know that this is a better alternative than something I'm getting out there. And I think that goes against all of the things that we've been taught, you know, when it comes to like business school, right? You know, product quality, market, niche, et cetera. And my honest answer is, is if you can build a really decent product that solves a problem, which in this case, the liquid death solves a problem, it might not kind of be there to the, the general public to know what problem is solving, but for the person who actually gets it, they'll get it. I feel if you can build a really good good product, really what comes first after that is your brand. If you can build really strong branding, branding that's really focused and dialed in into like what you are, that is really the biggest battle. The rest of it's just marketing then and really making sure that you can execute on the right marketing strategy with the right influencers, with the right people that it needs to execute on that. You can build any product as long as it's something a customer's going to keep and not retain. That's for me is really the way I look at it now because everything that I've looked at, like we work with Lemon Perfect, it's lemon water. They're taking a customer like me who goes to a restaurant and I get a water and I ask for lemon on the side and like, why don't we just take that and put it together? And, you know, it's it's so simple and they're not really doing anything that's, you would say proprietary. It's not unique at all. And it's, 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 I think that that's something in itself is when you take something that is humanly complicated when we don't see that opportunity. It's just so complicated in our world offline when we're buying it or we're asking for it. But then when someone packages it and says, okay, I see an opportunity here and I'm going to turn this into a marketable product, our margins are going to be really high because this product is a commodity in general. We're just really merging everything together. I think that that's the new way to scale. Like for me, I think if you can find really simple problems in the market and it's regularly used by people and you can solve that for the consumer, the rest is all brand and marketing. And I think yeah, there's like there's some examples that I think of like some mega D to C brands that have been created over the last you know five to ten years. Uh, obviously, like Dollar Shave Club, big one. Uh, there's mm-hmm. uh, these like two like hymns in Roman. I think they're what they're called. They did like hair loss for men, and then they did like erectile dysfunction. Yeah, and those are like two mega brands, man. Like they are epic. And then uh, you've got like Rent the Runway, another epic one. Uh, now they have like an interesting back back end play on how they do their their product merchandising and everything. But uh, you know, mega brand. You got like Stitch Fit, Sti- Stitch Stitch Fix, another like mega brand. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of um, my my wife uses these little travel containers. Yeah. Uh, I forget what they're called. I I just messaged her on uh, Google Hangouts to see if she gets back to me and I can say the brand name, but they're like these little like plastic containers that they, uh, they like twist and you can put like pill, you can put like, uh, like supplements or, you know, shampoo or like, you know, cosmetics, like cream and stuff. And they like magnet together into like, they're like a hexagon shape. They magnet together and they're like $30 a piece, man. So if you need like 10 of them, you're spending $350 for like little plastic jars. Wow. And uh, I think I saw, they said, I think on their website, I forget, I got to pull it up, but I think they sold 2 million units or something. So, you know, it's like some of these brands, man, it's like, it's nuts. And then, you know, uh, my wife just ordered a bunch of them and they, they're, they had like four issues in a row with, they didn't like ship the right one for like, they shipped like half her order to start and then she complained and then they shipped someone else's order from Virginia. That wasn't even what we ordered. And then Small she went products, back. complex problems, right? Yeah. And then, then she can, compl- oh, she just messaged me. It's called uh cadence, keep your cadence.com. I've heard of them. Yeah. yeah. So, so then, so then she complained again and then they shipped the wrong one again, or they like, they forgot one of the units or something. <laughs> so like, it took like four times, like four customer service mistakes to get it right. And, yeah. uh, and dude, it was like, it was like $500 or something for like a small batch of containers. Uh, we got a bunch free cause they shipped us that order from that woman in Virginia. But, uh, like it's, it's just like little plastic containers. Like it's nothing fancy. Nothing fancy, yeah. And then margins are probably through the roof, is my guess. 
I have to imagine, man, like yeah. the, their average <laughs> order value must be like three to $500. And they're selling like essentially like plastic jars. <laughs> <laughs> and that's an example, like the container store, right? Like that would be probably someone the container store would either acquire or some, I think that's the, to your point, Brian, I think that's really where a lot of these micro brands, like these micro brands, like Liquid Death, Lemon Perfect, you know, Magic Spoon, the brand that you're mentioning, they're just trying to grab a small piece of market share. And ultimately, if they can merge or get acquired by a container store or a large beverage brand like Coca-Cola, you know, I think that's really the angle because I don't feel like these segmented brands have a lot of scalability because they, they start to really spread out into more products. They become what these retail brands wear. And these retail brands have something that they don't have, which is scalability on the retail side. They have a massive consumer database that they've got access to. So I, th I think that that's probably what most of these brands are going to do. Did you see, do. Uh, what was it, Nature Deodorant, I think is what it's called? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sul Suleiman Ali, I think is the guy or Ali Suleiman or whatever. Um, I was, uh, I, I listened to this podcast, my first million. I think we talked about it. Uh, you're a listener too. Yeah. And yeah. so uh, they, they were telling the story about when, when they, they sold it, I think to Procter and Gamble and they were doing it like a hundred million dollar valuation or something like that. It was some, some nine figure valuation. And like, I guess the M and a person at P and G was like, all right. Uh, so like how, like, they're like, this is just a, uh, you know, they're, they're like, this is just deodorant. Like we're already selling deodorant. How are you coming up with this valuation? And he started talking about the brand moat. And they're like, well, you already like, you already like kind of cornered this deodorant market. Like, how are we going to expand this? And then he, he answers back. He's like, let me ask you this. Does your product labeling team have the ability to write nature on, you know, other products? <laughs> <laughs> if so, there's your, there's your expansion strategy there. I guess he was stumped after that, right? What's that? I guess he was stumped after that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we we have the ability to write nature on uh, other <laughs> products. <laughs> it's a capability we've developed here. Uh, yeah, I mean these brand moats, like it is, uh, it is ridiculous. Uh, and I I remember like early on in that nature deodorant story, I heard a different uh, time when they were basically like putting things in the chem, like they're putting like ingredients in the deodorant. Yeah, and like A/B testing it, and they're like, our deodorant has uh, antioxidants. And, uh, and everyone's like, oh, deodorant with antioxidants. Yeah, I need that. Yeah. And uh, they're like, yeah, there's no scientific backing or anything. Like we just put antioxidants put in it. here just to see if it would create more conversion. Like there's actually nothing like backing it. Like I don't know if antioxidants is good in your armpits or not, but yeah. uh, it like gets more conversions to happen. So that, that's the scary part about some of these brands that are coming up. Brian, is I actually, funny enough, I've got a, a short story. Is I purchased this brand that was new. It was a new DC brand. And you know, like, you know, the, um, the eye patches underneath the eye, it was like a stick you put underneath you. And I started using it because I'm getting a bit older. I'm, I'm, I'm getting 40 in five years, so I'm not old, but I'm getting there. You say you're 45? I'm 35. 30, I'm okay, I was going to say, there's no way you're 45. No, <laughs> I'm not, not there yet. Nearly. And uh, I was using this eye stick. And after a few months, I started to get this white mark right here. And I messaged her, I went to a, a dermatologist and they said, have you been using something in your eye? And I was like, yeah, I've been using the stick. And they were like, I forgot what the word they used. It was like a white little dot, like a little pimple there. And they had to like take it out. And I ended up asking them like, was this likely? And they were like, yeah, it was probably that causing it because it creates these microfibrins on your eye and it builds up and builds up and goes inside your skin. So I messaged the company about it. I got zero reply. And I messed them four times and they, they wouldn't reply to it. And I think that's the scary part is a lot of these brands launch and, you know, whether it's a beauty brand, food product, some of them do test, but some of them don't. And I think that's the part where I don't like about D2C is you've got people creating products and they think out of their kitchen, they know what they're doing, but they're not getting it properly tested. And I think that's scary. That's really, really scary. One person that I know who, who really went through a whole testing process, I'm sure you, you know who they are, um, I'm forgetting now, Native, Moise Ali. Oh, that's, I said nature before. That's what I meant was Native. Native, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I was saying the wrong thing the whole time. Native. Yeah, it's okay. I, I'm not the best with it as well, but Native is the company. Um, yeah, Moise Ali was the one who, who, who grew that and he sold it to um, Profit and Gamble. And like he went through like a ton of testing on that. Um, but like initially it was just him making it 
trying to come up with a formula and then he had to pass it on to you know other people to really formulate it correctly. But I think that's the scary part is there is brands out there not properly testing. And that's where it gets a bit tricky to kind of really know who's controlling the process. Is it FDA, you know, is it, is it what's the way I'm trying to remember? FDA approved. FDA remember. approved, yeah. So the, that's the part that is concerning, but we'll see where it goes, right? Yeah, I mean, this is uh, this is interesting to me. I, I don't think we've really like honed in on it yet, but, uh, you know, we, we keep kind of like coming to the conclusion that the brand is the moat. Uh, your product doesn't necessarily need to be the best, you know, it's it, the, you know, the better the product is, the more, the more it helps you, but like the brand and the brand marketing strategy is more important than the actual product. And if you're in a commoditized space, it's very difficult to win. But if you can like carve out a niche, like I had, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of tall slim tees, but I had the, uh, the founder of oh. tall slim tees on here. I, I wear tall slim tees cause it's the only shirt that fits me. I have like a closet full of 40 of them. <laughs> And uh, the guy who started it sold the company. And I had him on here as one of my early guests. And uh, like, you know, he was struggling to get it off the ground and eventually got it off the ground by like sponsoring men's professional volleyball or uh, yeah, like beach beach volleyball tournaments or something. Super niche, yeah. Yeah, I found like, you know, he was like trying basketball at first and that didn't work, but he found like this weird, he found this weird niche sponsorship and then got influencers in the men's uh, volleyball, beach volleyball space. And then it just took off. Wow. And wow. Uh, so that was, uh, that was interesting. And it's like, you know, at this point, there's kind of like a brand moat, you know, like it's, you know, if, if you're just getting regular tea, I guess there's like the fresh teas or whatever, um, clean fresh yeah. teas or whatever that that new brand is. And that's that's interesting, too, because that's like another brand moat strategy, because yeah. uh, like I would have thought T-shirts were like uh, it's a commodity. Yeah. Yeah. I would have thought they were done out by now. So it's crazy that, uh, you know, and I, I, just, I wonder, like, how much of this is, you know, I guess I guess you can you can probably give me some feedback on this, like how much of this is just kind of like luck and catching lightning in a bottle with the right brand, right time. Like how much of it is like chance versus a regimented strategy and execution process? Yeah. I, I think, I think all of, I think everything could go through in life is trust, right? Some, some, sorry, I think in life is luck a little bit. I think we've got to have a bit of luck um, when it comes to it. But for me, when I was listening to like Mike's story from Liquid Death or any of the brands we work with, a lot of it is just feeling like you've got this instinctive feeling like it's natural right when you're in business we have this instinct where we are good to tell us something and we'll go back and forth we'll be like okay i've got this right or this wrong but then it's just like about testing it out and what you mentioned about that volleyball idea of like he went through the basketball idea that he went through the volleyball the way i look at d to c if we're on that topic is I look at it as cracks is there's all these different cracks in all these different industries and you're trying to find one of those cracks. You're trying to find like, where is that little tiny opportunity where I can come in and actually carve out a small niche in a, in a really major market, but really carve out a brand that is going to be different than anything out there. That's super hard because it means you've really got to be thinking and looking for that type of opportunity or you just come across it miraculously. But I, I feel like a lot of the best brands that I've, met and come across have all come across because they were in front of them the problem they knew there was a problem and then they had a passion to solve that problem because they, it was either in their background you know mike came from a, a brandon background um, magic spoon they built the first ever cricket the actual insect bar they actually built the first ever cricket insect bar so they had a background in that in healthy food cricket, but like there was literally like crickets and you ate it like literally crickets they Took crickets, which is a commodity. <laughs> you would call it commodities, a lot of them. And then he just basically put them in a machine and converted them into a bar, a high beef protein bar. And that's what they started as. So you just Google cricket bar. Yeah. Uh, I'll go on to, I don't know what their name is, but their company name, but they started the cricket bar business, sold that off. But I, I think that's the real key is if you've come from a background of that and you're naturally curious or looking for that opportunity. I think that's really where a lot of it comes from is it's instinctive and it's good mostly. Is it, there's a exo protein or CRKT? I don't know the name of it. You probably have to go to Magic Spoon's co-founders LinkedIn and it'll show you. Yeah, I can't remember the name. They were one of the first cricket bar companies in the country to launch. 
Oh, I'm man. terrible with, with, with remembering those type of names, especially after a while. Here, I'll share my screen real quick. It's like crickets yeah. are nature's super food. I don't know if it's them. Why crickets? Actually, that'd be quickly. <laughs> There's a lot of protein in crickets, so if you want to give it a shot, that is actually quite a lot. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll find it for you. I'll send it to you. I wonder how many of the listeners are going to eat crickets after this episode. <laughs> If you eat crickets, uh, shoot, shoot an email or, or leave a comment in the YouTube on uh, your cricket experience. <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, let's uh, let's go back. I put a pin in the AI thing. So let's go back to that. Uh, you, you predicted that, what, three years from now, the agency industry is going to be drastically different than it is today from an AI disruption. Is that, uh, is that an accurate uh, summary? Yeah. I know three years is a specific number, but... I just feel like software is going to iterate far quicker than we know everyone knows in physical products. It's just going to iterate quickly. Um, based on what I'm seeing now, we're, we're going to be doing an AI innovation day in the coming quarter. And we're getting everyone hands on deck to really test out every tool to really understand how we can implement this into our workflow. I, you know, everyone's talking about it now. It's become like the thing, right? Everyone's just AI, AI, everything. But I do feel like this is a benefit to our business, but I, I think it's also uh, a bit of a disadvantage. I think the disadvantage is, is how much is it going to devalue our services? I think it's the big question mark. I think the benefit is that it's definitely going to make us more efficient. Um, will it make us better in margins? I don't really know the answer to that question yet. Um, but the software side, like, you know, I don't know how many AI tools are out there, but I'm reading like there's thousands already. I think the, the the way I look at it is very similar to Shopify. Like when they launched the app ecosystem, which is all the ancillary software that support the primary platform. Let's just say ChatGVD is Shopify. And around ChatGVD, you've got all these ancillary add-ons that are coming up. I see it being something like that. And I think what's going to end up search happening- search chat instead of uh, like that. That seems like the biggest disruption to me is Google search. Like, you know, we're no longer- putting in a short query and getting 10 blue links, you know, it's going to be some sort of a more uh, interactive uh, search experience. That's more like pro, you know, more curated or procured for the individual at the individual moment that they're, you know, making the query. Uh, yeah. I don't know how much that'll disrupt social. I think a lot of these D2C brands are largely like Facebook, Insta driven, maybe TikTok a little bit these days, but uh, especially the yeah. influencer mark, uh, market uh, channels that you're talking about. But uh you know, like what, what percentage would you say of like, if you looked at all of your customer portfolio in D2C, what percentage is being driven by like or Google organic or Google paid versus those other social and influencer channels? Google organic, Google paid, or say realistically, it's probably less than 20%. That's what less I would think. Yeah. yeah. I would think like, it's probably like what, 50, 60% paid social and maybe 30, 40% influencers. Yeah. It's probably pretty accurate. Yeah. Like that's where it's at. And even that's becoming saturated, to be honest, Brian, now, like everyone's doing it. Um, and that's the only, that, that's where it comes back to like find out those cracks. If you can't find out a crack, it's going to be very hard to compete because of, you know, the, the cat costs right now and CBCs across the industry is just too high. It's become basically a, a monopoly in certain segments because certain brands are owning all that now. So it's, well, there's all these like, uh, like platforms. I just Google searched it. Like there's Grin and like, uh, upfluence and uh, captivate and like all these things that are they're like platform there's like dozens of platforms now they're like upwork for finding influencers like before you know 10 15 years ago you just had to like be good at cold outreach and just you know have a good product fit and just reach the right influencers and you could get influencers on but now i feel like just even like the influencer business model is just super commoditized and yeah it's, it's interesting like everything's getting commoditized uh yeah. like I, and i wonder how much further this can go before like yeah i think there's just there has to be like a total like leveling of the playing fields like the whole game has to change a bunch of players have to die off and a new breed of players has to come in i think just to totally like shake up the whole way the game is played yeah i, it, I feel like we've become very comfortable the last decade like you know everything's been pretty comfortable for most businesses and it like they say every every recession that comes or Every decade, you know, new innovation happens. I think this is where the new innovation happens. And a lot of us are going to really get found out or we're going to adapt, change, pivot, learn, or we're going to be like, okay, well, 
do we want to learn or do we want to sell? Are we, are we out? You know, I think that's where really the test is going to come because with AI, I feel like it's definitely going to consolidate a lot of the job market in certain segments of different industries. So we're going to see less, this, I've been here and everyone say it's going to create tons of jobs. Yeah, it's going to create tons of jobs, but for a certain category. And, you know, it's, it's definitely an interesting time right now we're going through where I think a lot of companies are trying to figure out where the market's going. Are we going through a consolidation of money that's going to the top more? Is, 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 has the, has the, uh, has the, the bar just been raised a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, it's it's going to be interesting to see how it goes. And I think for us, we, we've just embraced that we need to keep learning. We need to figure out how we can get this implemented our business. And we don't know what we don't know right now. We've just got to really learn and understand how it's going to improve our business. And then from there, once we've got enough information, then we can start to figure out how our business is going to kind of be part of it, you know? So- is it a... Uh- is it like nervous? Does it make you nervous or excited that the whole game is about to change? I, I've, I'm embracing AI. I use AI every day, and I, I I love the fact that I can save time. I think a lot of the I'm the same, use- by the way. I, I it doesn't like I, I I'm, I'm excited. I think it's gonna like I think people like you and I who are just naturally just like hungry and you know like you you strike me like you know similar to me like you you would you know if new technology comes out you're gonna be like in your office all over, night yeah. and day for like the next <laughs> week, just like, you know, spending 80 hours figuring it out. Yeah. Uh, so that's like, that's good. Like that's going to be a good a net positive for, for people like us that have that, just like that screw loose in our head that we have to go do that. For uh, sure. Yeah. It's uh, the way I look at it is I was, I started using chat GBD about seven months ago. Um, sorry, not seven months ago, four months ago. And um, I was using another tool for, I was using Jasper.ai seven months ago. And when I started using chat GBD, the thing for me is people are worrying and like say, okay, this is going to eliminate my, my natural curiosity. It's going to eliminate my role. You know, me thinking for myself, it's actually getting done by a human. The reality is it's, it's, it's inevitable. It's going to happen. We're, someone's going to figure out how to use and implement it in business. So no matter what, we, we, you know, people hear and saying that, you know, my job's at risk. Like the key is, is just embracing it, learning it, figuring out how you're going to become a better prompt engineer, which I think is definitely a role in itself. And if you can at least implement that into your day-to-day life, that's going to definitely help you. But for me, when I look at it and it's like taking all these complex problems over decades, centuries, whatever we want to look at, I, I used to write an email out. It would take me maybe 15 minutes to write it out, get my thoughts, get all of it out make sure it's properly grammatically formatted, all that. Now I can go to chat EBD and I can write my points and say, these are the things I want to get across. And in five seconds, I've got an email written that just saved me 15 minutes of my time. That for me is an insane amount of time and value that I can now use elsewhere. And I think that's the way I look at it is where I can save time in different areas. Even for some of my content on LinkedIn, I'll get it to write it, but I'll repurpose it in my own way. But the point is, is it's achieving of the objective. The objective is not perfectionism. The objective is to get it done. And if I can get it done in a way where I'm still getting my point across and it's in my own style, if I can get it to that, in that direction, then what am I missing? You know, and I think people really don't get that sometimes. The other thing too, like, I think we're both services company people. Uh, you don't, you know, as a services business, you don't want to be too far ahead of the curve because the market isn't ready for it yet. Like the platform companies, the SaaS companies, the hardware companies, like they need to be like out in front of the curve because they're creating the technology that we're going to use to implement for our customers. Yeah. But in order for, in order for like a f- agency or a services firm to be ready to like fully adopt something into their like you know complete flow, their clients need to be ready to buy it. In order, in order for their clients to be ready to buy it you know, their, their, the client's customers need to be ready to use it and adopt it. So, uh, that's usually, I would say that's usually like the second wave. Like if you look at crossing the chasm, like that's maybe, you know, you definitely like in the first two waves, like the, the, uh, what do you call it? The, uh, innovators and the early adopters, uh, it's more, more so like when our clients are ready to start using something is in the early majority phase Mm -hmm. typically. Yeah. It, that reminds me of Shopify, similar, because when they were before Plus, it was not ready for that next stage, but they were figuring it out. 
And I think that's kind of similar to where like AI is right now is yeah. everyone's trying to figure out the lay of the land and how it's going to really evolve sure. over the next few years, you know? So I'm, I'm, in, I'm an embracer. I'll be quite honest. I think that everyone should be embracing it. And I, I feel like if, if you're not embracing it, AI, I definitely think, you know, you're, you're missing a massive opportunity. So uh, I, I'm a, I'm an advocate. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you, man. Um, all right, let's, uh, let, let's move on. Uh, I, 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 we're going to go totally off the topic of D2C here. Uh, when we had lunch a few months ago, you were telling me about some of your investing strategy. Now, before we go into it, uh, we're going to say that uh, this is not financial or investment advice. Uh, you know, both Adam and I may hold positions in some of the companies we're going to talk about, yada, yada, yada. Uh, disclaimer language. So, uh, but yeah, definitely really interested in uh, like just rehashing that conversation. So you, you made some like really big, like all in style bets on a few companies and some of them have like really paid off. Some of them, you know, are yet to be determined, but uh, I'm really like, I'd, I'd love to just kind of like riff through that conversation again, like how you like the, I think you made a few different trades over the last, you know, four or five years. Uh, and then like the company that you're at, the company that you're like really bullish on now, I want to hear more about that company again. Yeah, for sure. Um, see, I've been, I've been getting into private investments for a few years now and started to touch into, you know, public investments about three years ago, right when 2020 happened. And the one piece private of investments is like angel rounds or something or. Yeah. Yeah. Angel rounds. So did a few angel rounds, got involved in a few interesting startups, companies that were established. So that's been definitely successful for me. And, you know, for me, what what I, I really am frustrated about, which I'll tell a quick story here. In December of 2019, I posted a video on Facebook. I share some videos online now and again of just my thoughts on stock, just to kind of put up that knowledge. And at the time, I think Tesla was worth around 250 bucks a share. And I, I was saying to everyone why I believe Tesla was going to be over $2,000 a share. And at the time, I had a Tesla Model 3. And I remember getting in 2018, Brian. And like I was obsessed with like understanding the car because I ordered it online. And it was so easy to get it. The whole buying process was simple. I went to the store, picked it up, wasn't there for four hours, was there for 30 minutes and out. And then when I got it, I completely started comparing my wife's Hyundai MDX and my Tesla, like the dashboard of like all these little but the little buttons on the car. And I just really understand what they've done. So I ended up predicting it. I didn't end up buying it at 250 bucks. You um, did not buy it? I did not buy it. And then oh, in 2020, you, uh, went, you're, you're kicking yourself for that one, right? Yeah, I was really kicking myself. So I didn't do it. And then around about uh, April of 2020, like when the pandemic was going on, you know, I jumped in and I actually uh, had some interesting moments. Um, so I can't talk much about it right now, but I, I'm actually the lead plaintiff for the largest individual lawsuit in the country right now. And um, it's against Zoom, which we're funny enough on right now. Um, <laughs> so um, I can't talk too much about it, but it's a basically about $150 million case that's happening right now um, across the country. And it was basically related to Zoom's encryption issue. They claimed on their website that they were encrypted, which was false at the time. As we know, there was a Zoom bombings. So I ended up getting into that and, um, you know, ended up not coming out very well there. Um, I had made some money and, you know, did well, but ended up, you know, really going in on them and trusted that the information was factual. So they I'll leave it really, at that. They got hit so hard, though. Like, I'm just going to pull up their stock chart because uh, they were like one of the top they were like one of the like highest climbs. Like they were trading before the, uh, I guess they, they IPO'd in 2019. And then they were kind of trading around like 70 to $90, like 70 to $80 a share before the pandemic. And then basically like right when the pandemic started hitting, like they started to go up and they didn't even like, you know how most companies had that quick dip and then climb back up from the pandemic. Like they didn't even have any dip. Yeah. They just went straight up. Like as soon as the pandemic hit, they just went straight up. And like peaked out at what, like 560, 580 a share. Yeah. And then they hovered like in that like th like 300 to 400 range until the end of 2021. And then just kind of like, they've just been on a steep decline. And now they're like, they're back to their pre-pandemic prices, if not lower. Yeah. Which is really interesting. Like, you know, they've, 
since pre-pandemic, they I, I don't know exactly what their growth has been, but they definitely grew. Yeah. So that means their price, their price, uh, I don't know if their their earnings went down, but their price, their price to revenue has gone down. Like their price to revenue ratio is uh, what do they call it? P, PS, price to sales ratio. Yeah. Uh, their price to sales ratio is certainly down. Yeah. Maybe that's just the whole market, but. Uh, the whole uh, the whole pandemic situation definitely you know spiked a lot of these companies up. I think platforms like Zoom benefited from it. You know, it was definitely an interesting time. And you know, I, when I when I went through that process, you know, I ended up you know really making some some investments in different companies. And um, for me, I would say the type of investor that I am is I don't read charts. I don't believe in charts because like that's more of a day trading. I'm not a day trader. Um, I'm more of a, a long term holder. It's kind of the way I think and. Um, you know, one of the the probably the most successful one I had was was Slack. Um, I invested in Slack in August of 2020, and um, basically went quite big on it. And you know, ended up paying off. I bought in at 32, and I got in got out at 45. So that was really beneficial for me. I, I really invested in stocks that I knew. I think that was one thing that's been really good for me is when I get obsessed with stuff. I go really, really deep into it. I get kind of obsessed with understanding like each play. And I think that's what's, I think a lot of you when they're investing, whether you're uh, an experienced investor or kind of just occasional investor with 401ks, et cetera. I try and focus on investments that I really understand, like companies that I really get. So we use Slack at our company, we use Zoom, and you know, we use other, other, other companies that I invested in as well. So Slack was a, a really big um, success for me. And at the end of uh, 2020, you know, I started basically studying models. I was looking at, okay, you know, if I'm going to stay in something, I want to stick in something that I really believe in and something that's going to be more long-term. Um, because really the wealth, as we all know it, is made long-term. It's not made short-term. It's, it's compounding. And I started really just researching oil companies. The oil at the time was, was dropping um, because the pandemic no one was really driving. And it was around October 2020, and I was I was studying all of the U.S. oil companies um, at, at the time, companies that existed, companies that went bankrupt. And what I noticed was that in the basically the 1900s, early 1900s, mid 1900s, all of the oil consumption was all in the Middle East because the war was on that side of the world, and ultimately it was just geographically a lot better for countries to be buying oil from the Middle East because it was a lot more easier for shipping lanes. But then in the 1970s and 80s, something changed. Oil production in the US went up and went for a huge boom. And when I looked at some of those stocks at the time, there was companies that really peaked in like the late 90s, early 2000s. They were about $100 to $1,000 plus a share. And then they all went down after 08. And I started to, to realize that there was something happening, like there's something going on. And I basically decided, okay, the oil is not where it's at. And at the time I had a Tesla. So then I started studying um, why the Tesla was so expensive. And the reason why the Tesla has been so expensive is because the battery in itself, lithium, is the most expensive part of the car. It's not anything else. It's just the, it's the lithium. What percentage does it make up on average? Yeah. Yeah. What so percentage? Uh, what percentage does it make up on average of the of cost? the car? It's it's over thirty percent of the car. Wow. Yeah. So between like thirty and forty percent of the car, so about a third. Yeah, it's really it's to replace the lithium battery. Back then, it was about eighteen thousand dollars to replace a lithium battery in a Tesla. Now it's down to about fourteen because the market's starting to catch up a bit more with lithium production. And I went for this weird research. I kind of scratched the oil thing, and I'm like, okay, this is not where it's at. And I started researching. In automobile companies and this was 2020 and i typed in on google tell me the newest up-and-coming ev brands coming up and i basically saw fisker rivion arrival all these brands and i started asking some of my friends who were like car enthusiasts one of them's like a bmw enthusiast i'm like have you heard of this brand before and he was like no and i was like and i said interesting spoke to another friend he was like no and which, which started- brand are you talking about um, basically, Rivion, Rivion, Fisker. Um, another one would be, uh, why am I forgetting the name? Why am I forgetting? It's the one in LA. Uh, they were funded a billion dollars by Saudi. And why am I forgetting it? Oh, I'm- yeah. If, I know what you're talking about. So so, yeah. the, so what year? So I know all those brands now, but what year were you asking your friends about? 
this was like mid August of 2020. Okay. I mean, I, I knew of both Rivian and Fisker before that, but, uh, but they, they're, they're, they're like a drop in the bucket compared to Tesla. Yeah. At the time, but the general consumers didn't know anything about these brands. And that was the thing is, it's like people who actually were interested in tech, they, they kind of get, got it. And I just started noticing this really crazy change going on. And I basically correlated it with B2C. You've got B2C brands who are sleeping, which in this case is legacy automobile brands. And you've got Tesla coming up acquiring micro market share. It's exactly the same thing that I was noticing, like a direct coloration. And they were all pre-revenue, all massively funded, all very similar directions of going with Tesla, but just different brands, you know, with the Rivion, they're trying to target, go after Land Rover, you know, your Ford, Jeeps, all of that market, you know, the more SUV market focus. And then I started like looking at them and I looked at the multiples that they could get to and it could probably triple, quadruple, maybe five times and maybe a bit more. But the reality is, is it, it was going to take some time to get there. And that's where my kind of shift focus to, to lithium and then I, started I think there's uh, just uh, sorry, I'm uh, sorry to interject here, but the uh, I, I think there's there's electric car company values are already like super priced in for like future growth. So there's not like you know there, it's not like you're getting in early anymore. Like the investors have already priced in the future market. Yeah, and it's I, I think that it's a really good point, Brian. Like it's a lot of the legacy automobiles like Ford, they're building a 13 billion dollar plant in Tennessee right now, fully dedicated EV plant because. They've got this older school factory process that they now want to compete against a new school factory process compared to Tesla. Tesla's 50% built by robotics. That's what they're competing against. So a lot of these companies coming up now, they're catching up and the price is already baked into the value. I think that's a really good point. Um, And, you know, I I started kind of looking at that and looking at, okay, what's going to be the biggest need? It was lithium. And that's where I started studying lithium companies. Uh, I started the mining originally looking at mining companies and I kind of started where it all kind of began for me was Tesla. Why was the car so expensive? And I started to study the supply chain of how they get their lithium today. And it's a company called Genfeng. It's a, it's the largest lithium miner in the world in China and kind of breaking it down into a simple process. They have three different mines in China. One's for nickel, one's for cobalt, one's for manganese all different plants they've got to build, manage. They've got people that have got to mine it. It gets mined, that's one cost. Then it gets transported, another cost. Then it gets put in the dock estate cost. Then it has to get transported across from China to San Francisco, it's another cost. Then it goes to the port, there's a tax and duty cost. Then it has to get transported by a special vehicle to Tesla's um, assembler, which is Panasonic. Tesla have a, a Panasonic partnership which Panasonic built a dedicated plant 10 miles from Tesla's plant in Nevada. So now they get it sent, all the material gets sent to Panasonic and then Panasonic basically compartmentalize it and build its battery packs. But Tesla, Tesla manages the supply chain for all that lithium purchasing, right? And Panasonic is just like the contract manufacturer that's just kind of assembling the batteries with the materials that Tesla provides them. Exactly, yeah. So you've you basically got six to seven people touching that product before they even get to the end supplier, which is Tesla. That's the reason why it's so expensive. And it's also because we just don't produce enough of it because it hasn't been enough of a focus because we haven't really focused on EV. Also, China has a monopoly, right, on lithium. There's not really, uh, I guess we'll get to uh, how, how that monopoly might be broken, but uh, but China kind of historically has the lithium monopoly, right? Is there any other mines anywhere in the world or any other companies that are non- China owns that are uh, successfully mining any any real quantity of lithium? So the real three main players in the world, it's China, Australia, and the third one would be South America. They're the main places where it's produced today. The problem, and this is actually a, secure, a, a national security problem for the US, is we only produce less than 1% of the global lithium supply in the US. So with us transitioning now to electric across not just you know, general consumers, but military, all the different areas of, you know, life in our world, it, it's going to become a huge problem, security problem for this country, because if you get to a point where there is a huge war, which I hope to God there isn't, you know, it's very easy for these countries to basically cut off our supply chain of lithium, which now means we need to produce our own lithium. 
as you probably saw and probably people seen a few years back, uh, Biden announced the Energy Act, which basically is to make the US energy independent. And you know, from all that research of understanding the supply chain, um, you know, the real big problem with mining is it's it's highly labor intensive, it's costly, it's not good for our planet, and it takes time to get these facilities online. Does that go for all lithium mining? Like it's just like by by in nature, it's just not good for the planet. It's got, you know, bad carbon footprint, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. All across the board, it's, it's not good. And it takes years to get it online. If for a f- facility to launch a, a, a massive mining facility, it takes three to five years to launch it, depending on where you're, where you're located. And it's if they're costly, they cost hundreds of millions, some of them. And they're not cheap. So I, I keep hearing uh, that like, Electric vehicles are not as carbon neutral as people think. Uh, not not because of like the not you know there is like the aspect of producing the electricity. You know, sure the vehicle itself does not put out as much carbon. You know, uh, byproduct, but uh, like the, the, you have the cost of generating the electricity, but then you have the cost of the batteries, like making the batteries and getting yeah. the raw materials for the batteries. And that if you actually like do the math, it's actually worse for the environment than fossil fuel vehicles. Yeah, I've, I've, you're not the first person I've heard say that as well. It's 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 definitely, I would say, more of a long-term view on it because the reality is, is with us transitioning to electric, where does our electricity come from today? A lot of it is going to come from carbon, you know, gas, all of the ways we're producing electricity, but that's also going to catch up. So I think once these electricity companies start to more push to renewable energy, solar, it will naturally kind of start to really level itself out. I think the problem is, is analysts that I've seen say that, they're not thinking about, okay, where do these electricity companies need to change in order to make it fully sustainable, you know, environmental friendly for us? It's the reality is, is the supply chain at this level needs to catch up in order for it to really, at the bottom level, be, be, where, it, be where it's at to be ultimately environmental friendly. That's kind of the reality of it. So it's, it's a long game. That's the way I look at it. Yeah. Okay. I keep taking, we're like walking down this long hallway and there's all these doors. I keep like opening doors and then we like go check out what's in this room and that room. But uh, we're back on the hallway back, you know, headed, headed where we're headed. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's all a long term part of it where we're going towards. So it's going to definitely get there. And for me, um, the mining side, I ended up completely scratching that. And then I started really focusing on recycling and the issue What's happened with recycling is historically any batteries we use in this country, it typically goes to a scrapyard. And in a scrapyard, they basically separate everything into metals, batteries, whatever it is. And because it's hazardous waste, the US basically call them stock feeds or feedstocks. They ship them overseas and they ship them to typically Asia. And then they burn all of these hazardous materials down because they don't want to burn them in this country and it's it's a hazardous waste. Now that material today is is like gold because ultimately the problem that's been happening is there's been no company in the world that's been able to produce recycled lithium and contain and basically save 90% of the minerals. What happens is when they send it overseas, they burn it down and they basically save maybe 40, 50% of the minerals. That's magnesium, cobalt, and uh, nickel. But then bringing that back over to the US, it's not profitable enough for them to reship it back over. And that's where the you know, recycle came in for me. So the, the company I invested in, who I've got a pretty big bet on, is a American Battery Technology. And they compete with two other companies, LI Cycle and Redwood Materials. Redwood Materials was the former founder of Tesla. He launched this. Um, and then you've got LI Cycle and, and maybe ML kind of the three main players. So yeah, what uh, so it's, uh, stock ticker ABML, uh, and their pink, pink, uh, what do you call it? Pink slips or whatever, uh, pink sheets. Um, OTC stock, market yeah. is the the stock exchange. Um, yeah, interesting chart. Uh, they're trading at. A, I'm just looking right now. They're trading at a 526 million dollar market cap. Uh, pre, I, I want to see what happened here. Pre December 2020, they were trading at like. 10 or 15 cents a share for a long time since since their IPO. Uh well, I guess they had they had a little bit of a you know a higher IPO in 2016 and then kind of fell to that 15, 20 cents or 10, 10 to 20 cents a share range. And then like December 2020, they just like shot from you know being average like 15 cents to uh 
by February, 2021, $4. almost $4 yeah. a share. Like what happened there? Like, why was that? I think that was just a pump to be honest with you. I think it was a pump by, by some of the people in at the time. Um, was that the they, stocks or was that like Reddit, uh, wall street bets people, or was that, uh, like internal insiders? Probably insiders. They had, a, they had someone there that, you know, he's no longer there, which is a good thing. I think, um, the, the, the real way that, that today, they are pre-revenue, but what I like about them is, is their CEO, like, you know, any, any company investing, you're investing in, in the person that kind of runs it. Ryan Melsud, he was the former head of battery technology at Tesla. Uh, he was one of the top 1% employees and he was the one who discovered this whole problem of like supply chain with lithium and him and a, another person from Tesla um, basically sat in a lab for three years and tried to figure out how to build a recycling process that would save 90% of the battery and produce it onshore. And they basically proved it on a lab scale that it was, it was basically successful. And they won an award by, uh, basically it's called the Lithium Organizations of America. And uh, it's the main body for lithium as one of the most innovative lithium products that is, has come out of the US. And it was basically all around their propriety recycling system. And what they're doing right now is they, um, they're basically fully focused on building a recycling plant right now. It's 10 miles from Tesla. And they've got two plants they're launching. They've got a pilot plant, which is going to act as an innovation center. And they've also got another commercial size plant about another five miles down the road. For me, um, if they can really get this commercial plant launched and um, you know, get a cash flow positive, which can happen very quickly because to launch these businesses is very low cost compared to mine them. You know, I'm, I can see them potentially being a seven to $10 billion business, 50% net margin by 2032. That's kind of what I'm following. I'm following what their plan is and what they've put in place. You said about a seven, seven billion dollar business. So the 14 X roughly based on that uh, trajectory. Yeah. I think they're going to be a seven to seven to $12 billion business in the next five okay, so to eight 20 years X now. roughly. 20 X in the next uh, six years. Um, This guy's young too. I'm on his LinkedIn. It looks like he started college in 2000. So he's roughly what, like uh, 42 or something or 43. Yeah. He's he's a super smart guy. Um, He's a, I would like to say like, he's a, he's a natural visionary, but he's a tech visionary. He's like a must go to jobs. Like he's a tech person. He's not a, a business guy, which is what I like about him. He understands the science behind the product. And the way they're doing it is is really strategic. Like they invest them wisely, and um, they've not diluted themselves a lot. Similar to LI Cycle, LI Cycle have raised nine hundred million. I believe that Aiden Melville only raised about one hundred and fifty. Um, Ninety of that is private, and then sixty of it is through federal funding. So I've got big hopes for them, and um, I think they're gonna. I I personally, in my opinion, I think that they they're gonna be the leader leader in recycled lithium. That's what I what I think, but that's my prediction. So Did you we'll tell see. me, I think, I think you told me at lunch, maybe I'm making this up. So let me know if I'm just like totally making up baloney here. But uh, I think you told me that they could be a trillion dollar company at some point. It, it, I would say a billion dollar company, not trillion. No, <laughs> trillion okay. definitely a long way away. I'm I, probably making I, up baloney then. Okay. I, I, uh, I'm, I would say stock price where I would say realistically, they could be in the next 20, 30, 32 it's between fifty and hundred dollars. That's conservatively, um, and I say that because if I'm looking at, well, that's more than a twenty x man. That's a hundred x. I yeah. mean, they're, they're trading today at uh, at seventy seven cent, seventy six cents with a five hundred twenty six million dollar market cap. So if they go to, uh, um, if they go to hundred dollars a share, then uh, let's see here. So seventy seven divided by hundred. So that's um. That's 120, that's 130x increase. So 130x on 526 million. That would be uh that would be a 68 billion dollar market cap. Yeah. So right, yeah. It's I would compare them to um Albumair, which is a one of the largest lithium producers today, but not recycling. Albumair of doing about eight billion a year. Um I'll spell it for it's A B E R A L M E. That's the other company. So Looking at their market cap, where they're at, um, they've got a pretty similar direction they're going to go in. But my prediction with ABML, kind of knowing, I think that's what's important when you kind of visualize and invest in these companies. You've got to know each step and what move they're going to make. 
I I think that Tes- Tesla are going to be ABML's first partner because for me, I think what's going to happen is once they launch this commercial plant in the coming months, I think they're going to say Tesla are going to say we've got exclusivity to this plant. Send all of your feedstock directly to Nevada, produce the minerals, send it directly down to Panasonic, which is 10, 15 miles from ABML's plant. And now they've completely eliminated this completely complicated supply chain and high cost of their battery by not buying it overseas and just buying it locally down the road from them. And you get the same exactly. quality lithium by recycling that you could exactly the same. No difference. Exactly the same quality. Okay. I mean, it's, also- it's almost uh like Strikes me a little bit of like, you know, the NVIDIA story. Like there's um, there's some incumbents like, you know, in NVIDIA's case, you had Intel and AMD uh, who are the incumbents. And uh, NVIDIA just came and just like, you know, showed them, showed them, showed them what, <laughs> you know, what uh, what the future was going to be. Like the other ones were all making CPUs. NVIDIA is like, you know, we're going to make GPUs. And then they found all these additional <laughs> use cases for you know, GPUs for like crypto and, you know, machine learning, they like, they essentially like created the capability of machine learning. So this stuff we talked about with AI earlier, uh, NVIDIA like pr- predicted that happening before like TensorFlow or any of these things even existed. Like NVIDIA was betting in the nineties that this future of like machine learning and like models and, you know, vector, uh, you know, ve- vector mapping and all this stuff, like pr- predictive, uh, algorithm, you know, uh, like, you know, this uh, machine learning, like predictive algorithm stuff, like they were like already building the hardware for that a decade before there was even the smell of a market. So yeah, uh, it seems kind of like what this, this company is doing. Uh, it's, inter- it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm curious though. So you, you talked only about the recycling business, but I just saw like right after we had lunch a couple of months ago, I started, re- I started reading up on them and like that same week they acquired some mine in Nevada. And then all of a sudden, like all the environmentalists and activists came in and there's like a huge protest, like don't mind, it's bad for the environment, you know, all yeah. that stuff. Um, what are like, what are they doing? Like they're, so they're doing like, they have, they have the recycling business, which is what you talked about, but now they're like something about a 30 year lith- lithium supply, which also happens to be in Nevada, like right next to the gigafactory. So it's like, you can't make this shit up, man. It's all like, it's all right it's all there. Together. So, you know. If they actually do mine lithium, it's like take it right from the mine to Panasonic and then assemble it and then ship it right to the Gigafactory. Like it just stays right in that little triangle right there. Yeah, it's, I was actually going to mention that. So I appreciate you bringing it up. But yeah, they, I think that's the part for me where I'm not concerned because a lot of companies when you invest in them is like how much runway they've got. You know, they've just uh, found out just in the coming months and um, months, sorry, not coming months, the months just went by that they have basically one of the largest lithium mines in the country right now. And their drill rate, like how close the lithium is to service is really at, at really the most dense level of some of the lithiums mining companies in the country. So they can drill 800 freight and they've got access to minerals pretty quickly. Um, but they've also built a proprietary drilling process, which is more environmentally friendly than most of the traditional where do they get all this cash though man they have a 526 million dollar market cap like where's all this cash for like acquiring land and like acquiring drilling equipment and like paying for all the labor you know you said it's like a five-year operation to get it spun up like where is all this cash coming from to do all this so they've got a, a lot of grants right now pending with the federal government so ryan is actually on the board with the department of energy the minerals division so he's got kind of an in from what i can see um, but they've got multiple grants right now that are pending, like really large grants. Um, this commercial grant that they're looking to implement, which is for their drilling for their land, which is a separate business for them for their recycling, that's a whole other opportunity. Um, I believe their grant is over 100 million to build that around their proprietary system. And really, the governments are really trying to support businesses that are more environmental friendly, are building new tech because they want to control our tech in the country, which makes sense. Um, this mine specifically, it's got about 30 years of runway, as you mentioned. It's worth probably close to 50 billion, you know, in terms of revenue top line over that time period. So if they wanted to sell this tomorrow, they basically got an asset on the balance sheet right now. And that asset is really where for me is the security is. If they sold this to a Lithium America or an album medium right now, it would probably sell over a billion dollars is my guess. And um, 
So they've got a huge asset that anyone could just really take off of them right now. So that for me is really the security that I'm kind of banking on. Um, but they've got a, a lot of money that's coming their way. That's that's the best way to put it. So they've got the recycle end and they've also got the the mining end, which is um, all in Nevada, kind of ironically. But I guess, you know, they got lucky. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, it's just a story like, you know, it seems like you can't make this stuff up. Like, it's just, uh, it does seem like an opportunity that's like extremely early, you know, like buying Tesla and, you know, I forget when they IPO'd, but like buying Tesla at like, you know, $10 a share or something. Like, it seems like it could be one of those opportunities. Uh, yeah. Again, not financial advice to the listeners. We're not, you know, we're not trying to instruct you to purchase any securities or make any particular investments. Uh, but yeah, the last time after we met, I did, uh, I did start a position and I've been adding to it. So, nice. uh, you know, you got me, uh, you got me in the ABML camp here. <laughs> Glad I could contribute. Hopefully, I, I, I think I'll pay off. That's all I can say. So I didn't go all in. I, you know, I, I, uh, I, I got, I got a nice, nice position, but uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a small percentage of my, uh, my total holdings. But I, I'm, go. I'm excited. I'm going to keep adding to it. There you go. Um, su super interesting. What, what do you think is going to be like the next event where we see, you know, a five or ten x run up, or you know, a two x run up, or whatever on this thing? It seems like one of those stocks where it's just gonna like hover, hover, hover. Or maybe it'll just slowly kind of dwindle, and all of a sudden, like boom, like four x, and then. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. I think you're spot on. It's uh, really this commercial plant they're launching. If they can get this launched, I would say, you know, by next year, end of next year, for me, I'm, I, I think they're probably gonna be worth between five and ten dollars by the end of next year. That's kind of where I'm at with it. If they can really get cash flow positive. They can get the, the capacity for this commercial plant up to where they need to get it to. Um, I think that's where they'll get that traction. And then from there, it's just really, really relaunching, repeating that model. Uh, to be honest, my prediction with them is I think with this pilot plant and this other commercial plant being right next to Tesla, they've got um, one advisor, a board advisor on their board right now, who is the former CEO of Ford's EV division. And I think really the big opportunity for them to scale, in my opinion, this is just my own theory. I think what ultimately is going to happen is once they prove out this concept of their factory and how much they can save with the battery and how easy it is to separate those minerals with their, their process, I can see a lot of these big automobile companies like Ford who are launching this massive EV plant in Tennessee in the next few years, coming to them and saying, hey, we want to take this pilot plant that produces 20,000 metric tons a year, and we want to replicate this on our site in Tennessee, and we want to have an, a supply chain directly on our facility. And I think that's the opportunity because they're going to want basically speed. They want efficiency. And for them to mine, it's just it's just too labor intensive. I think that that's the scale model that ABL could implement is just taking factories, blueprinting them, replicating them for all of these different automobile companies. And then just basically having a circular supply chain for them directly right next door to them. That's where I think is the opportunity. So we'll see, but that's my prediction. You got me intrigued, uh, no doubt. Uh, I was talking to my uh, my personal investment uh, advisors and they, they're like, they're former tr like Wall Street trader guys. So they, they did all sorts of like, you know, I don't know, it was like hedge fund stuff or like family office stuff back in the day back in like the dot-com era. And uh, they were uh, they were looking at this saying like, yeah, the, definitely the strategy here is to prove themselves on the pink sheets and then like, you know, re-IPO or whatever you call it, like convert over to a NASDAQ or like a New York Stock Exchange listing in the next, you know, yeah. couple of years. And then if they can do that, that'll give them a really big pop. Like once, once they get like, because in the pink sheets, basically they were saying to me that like, you can't get institutional investors, like you can't get endowments and like, you know, uh what do you call it like uh retirement funds or like uh pension funds or anything you can't get those big institutional investors to invest in this because they're not traded on a like a highly reputable exchange so once they can get like the the sec stamp like all right you're on the nasdaq or the new york stock exchange that should be like a big uh Step kick yeah. yeah for them yeah that's that's really the next big up for them brian yet it's i think once they prove out in a cash flow positive they'll be able to get that approval. And it's, you know, to that point, and I think this is a bit of a, a quick segue, is when I was, when I look at any company that I'm investing in, I, I really start by looking at like the owners or the CEO, because for me, like 
when I was looking at, like I study things really aggressively and really understand the team behind it and um, the people behind it. With LI Cycle, the interesting thing I saw was that they raised 900 million and the two people that founded it own a very, I think it's less than 10% they own. And when I look at that, I'm like, they're just chasing the money. That's all they're doing. They're trying to raise, 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 get to market share, you know, capitalization as much as they can and really get, get ahead. But ultimately, it's a long game. Like when I look at Apple, right, you know, Jobs, when he came in, he, he really went that long path because he believed in himself. And I think that's what I like about companies like ABML and other companies I've looked at is I want to, I want, I personally want to invest in someone that is better on themselves and that actually want to do it the strategic way, not run for the money and actually understand it's going to be a process. And, you know, for me, I would, I would rather be better myself on an innovator than someone that who is actually trying to just chase after shiny objects just because they want to do something big. You know, I want, I want to go for someone who actually want to do something disruptive. And I think Ryan, in my opinion, I'm not bigging him up, but like, I think he's got something to prove. He's very quiet. They don't talk at all. They're just fully focused on the product, focused on the task at hand. You don't see all this PR buzz getting announced regularly like the other companies are. And that's something I really try and separate myself from is like, what's the noise and who's actually focusing? And that's something that I think I've tried to really stay, stay focused on as my investment strategy. Because I think there's something there, you know. We'll have to we'll have to have you on again in a couple of years and see uh, <laughs> see where they're at. And uh, obviously, I'm I'm rooting for it. But uh, we'll see. Adam, this was awesome, man. I'm glad you came on today. Uh, we had so many good topics. This, this is going to be a great episode. Uh, anything you want to close on? Uh, anything you want to plug or close on before we uh, you know hang it up here? No, I just want to say thanks for having me on, Brian. And uh, you know, if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, you know, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm active on there. So my name is Adam Butt. So feel free to search me up. I'm on Instagram, so feel free to connect with me. And uh, yeah, really appreciate me on, Brian. Cash flow. Did you clear your cash flow?